Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You can see the microphone is working fine. That's good. I'm glad to be here. I believe we are here for a purpose. Amen. Brethren, family, brethren. You know, one of the most important things, one of them, one of the most important things that we need to be doing, and the scriptures tell us this over and over, we just heard about it earlier from Brother Landry, is to edify one another. How many times have you been to meetings like this, and I've been a part of it too, where you've left and you haven't felt edified? In fact, I feel like you know, people feel like, well, the Bible talks about feet, and I'm going to do that stomping, you know, like, I remember that song about them boots are made for stomping, and I'm going to stomp on some people. Instead of edifying, we're, we're, we look for faults in one another. Hey, I'm full of faults and failures. Earlier, a gentleman came up to me, and this is a good story, not bad. He just, you know, gently said to me, you know, uh, Brother Barley, didn't you used to believe in universalism? And I said, yes, sir, I did. And I taught it. And I believed it. And I had lots of scripture verses that I thought supported that. And that's why I promoted the uh, doctrine of universalism. And, uh, and went to meetings. I was invited to meetings to speak. And then, of course, one time, uh, quite a few years ago, I was invited to another one of their meetings in Dallas, uh, Texas, and I had a funny spirit about me from the previous meetings, and I talked to a number of others, of other people there, and I said, you know, it just seems to me that every time I've gone to these meetings, that uh, the Israel message keeps getting more watered down, more watered down to the point. Last meeting, I didn't hear the Israel message at all, and it is talks. I heard more about universalism and love and spiritual Israel than I heard anything else. And I'm like, what is going on here? And so I said, so when you go to that meeting in Dallas, I want you, I think your calling is to, is to teach the Israel truth, to give several messages on the Israel, message, the Israel truth. So... Uh, that's what people need to hear. I think a lot of people are at these meetings. They don't understand the Israel message. And so I did it. And the people came up and they shook my hand and they were all happy about it. Thank God you're doing that. You know, we're all happy about that. Well, one of the other ministers got up right after me and started attacking me. And I'm like, why are you attacking me? And... Uh, he mentioned several points that, you know, he, he specifically went after the message. I think, basically, he's wrong in this area and that area. And I got up and I wrote some notes down on what he said. And I said, it, it, this isn't a, it isn't a competition thing. But what I realized is that he was twisting the scriptures. Blatantly twisting the scriptures. And so... Uh, I got up and I went after every one of those points. And you could see a change within the audience. And they were the, the, a lot of them, their eyes were starting to light up and said, wow, uh, we better rethink this universalism. And, of course, I said to myself, so you better rethink this universalism that you've been a part of. So uh, the question was, have you changed? Well, I certainly hope so. Now, you know, hey, I'm not here to say all people in the universal thing are bad, wicked, and terrible. That, I was a part of it. You know, it's like, uh, I criticize Judeo-Christianity, but hey, one time I was a part of that. I was a Baptist and, you know, grew up in the Baptist church. You know, uh, all that, that gets into so many other things. But I want to reiterate right now, get back on the message, and this will be Kingdom Now Part 2. Kingdom Now Part 2. What was one of the main things that I shared with you the, the first last night? That without a vision, we are perishing. Now, we've got to have the right kind of knowledge. You know, without biblical knowledge, we are self-destructing. 
And um, it's not just, you know, something that we read and, and we um, think, well, there, there, there's some good information there I'll use, but we'll dabble in it. And for a lot of people, and, and, and me at the same time, way back in the 80s, I, I just kind of dabbled in it, you know. And uh, yeah, this is a good book, and there I can get inspiration <coughs> from it, and I can quote from it, and you know, and I can sit in the audience and act like y'all, you know, or the audience, you know, and I can, I can pretend that I'm, I'm a great Christian. Well, I thought I was, but I had a lack of biblical understanding. I had a lack of kingdom understanding. You know, when Jesus came and preached, what did he preach? He preached the gospel of the kingdom message. He didn't preach the gospel of salvation. There were no altar calls in the scriptures. Well, that was a shocker many years ago when I learned that. I mean, I thought I was, you know, I tried to save people, especially when I was a Baptist, and, and I, for a while there, I was into Pentecostalism. I don't want to even get into that. <laughs> But I want to say before I get too far, one very important point. I think we've got it wrong. What do you mean we've got it wrong? I used to believe that it was good for us to separate. I want to tell you something. The strength of, of the enemy in their lie is that we need to separate from one another. Now, I'm not picking on Pastor Randy because he's my father. He was my father-in-law. I love the man. He taught great proof. And, but he got, but I know why he did that because he saw what the enemy was doing. But he preached that we should be separated to a certain extent. Okay. But, and, and he was talking about how the enemy comes in and infiltrates. And so we, we unite and we form church groups and we, a band together here, the enemy, it gives the enemy a, a chance to come in and infiltrate. And there, he wasn't the only one on that. And we all, we've all got the message a little bit skewed. But I don't think that way anymore. I'm convinced that we ought to be uniting. We ought to be coming together as a church group. We need to um, Find like-minded, come together with the brethren, come together as a true biblical church, meaning the church of Israel. There's only one church, folks. There's not denominationalism. It's just like a bull. It was the church of Ephesus, the church of Corinth, the third church of Thessalonica, the church of Rome. You know, it was... It, they didn't have, you know, the Lutheran church, the Methodist church, the Baptist church, you know, all going down the line. It was one church. It was the church of Israel. And that church was not multicultural. It was, what are most churches today? It's, not, it's, just, it's just like I, I heard, I, I was shocked. Came into town, and uh, we were at a restaurant when we first got in here eating, and, the, and the, the waitress says, have y'all seen Samson? I said, no. Oh, you got to go see Samson. It's one of the greatest things. We're the greatest shows in town. I said, okay, well, we'll try to get there, you know. Maybe we, maybe we can make it. When we get here, we find out that Samson, the man that's portraying Samson, is a, I was going to say an N word, is a black man. He's <laughs> a black man. Can you believe that? So Sandy and Larry, I think you were telling me about that too, that you had heard the same thing, and you were kind of curious, could that be? So she goes down to the office down there, and she has a conversation with them. And she says, oh, but uh, um, she, uh, she was telling, saying, you got to go see it, because he's not your typical, I may be saying it a little bit wrong, he's not your typical black man. He's a nice guy, basically. Are you kidding me? <laughs> see, that's the problem with the church and, and people's theology. I uh, went to a, uh, a meeting, and um, it was on political candidates. And this lady up there was was harassing this chaplain who was running for office because he was advocating God's law, including the death penalty. 
you know, and, and on other things too. And he took a firm stand against the sodomites and the homosexuals, the faggots. I got to call them the uh, gay name that they made up because of the gay about them. So she says, I think we ought to have love and grace for one another. And I looked around the audience. Now, you couldn't ask any questions because it's all controlled environment and everything for these uh, snakes. And uh, the audience, oh, yeah, yeah, grace. And I think, do you people eat grace to do what? Grace to sin? Yeah. Grace to violate God's law? Yeah. What's going on here? Again, without a vision, we are perishing. I want you to turn your Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Again, I'm going to move as quickly as I can to get as much in as I can. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. May I ask, think about it, what government? What government's going to be upon his shoulder? And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Now you might excuse the, ever, the Mighty God part. Um, I, I, he's just one of the Godhead. You know, he's there's three different gods, or maybe four, or whatever. And and you know, well then, heck, if that's the way it is, folks, I tell I've told people this for years upon years. Then you better pray to all the, all these various gods that you think that exist. But when I look in the Old Testament and throughout the Bible, it says the Lord thy God is one, not pluralistic God. And it talks about his mystery of the Godhead. Now, I'm sorry, but until we get the deity of Christ settled, we're not going to go a whole lot further because that's a major part of understanding the kingdom of God, folks. Amen. Now, you may call him Yahweh and, you, and Jesus or Yeshua or Yahweh or whatever. I get, you know, confused and listen to these so-called experts on what we should call him, you know. Well, whatever, you know. He, I like it in Matthew chapter 28, you know, uh, about uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and, uh, and, and the uh, Son and the Father. And it talks about uh, the, the Godhead and coming together in power. And what is the name? That was the question. What is the name? And it, it, the, the answer is, all of these entities, it says, the name is Jesus. You call all the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The name is Jesus. There's a three different gods there, like some people try. It's a trinity, brother. Do you understand that? Well, maybe. What do you mean by that? You tell me there's different gods? How many of you understand what I'm talking about here? I mean, we've got to get on the right track on this one. But anyway, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. His government is meant to increase. If I'm reading this correctly, and I know I'm not the most educated person in the world, but I, it says of the increase of his government. It's supposed to increase. And upon his kingdom, his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And the Lord sent his word unto Jacob and it lighted upon Israel. It light, his word has lighted upon Israel. Now, an interesting word is used here. Henceforth. From henceforth, meaning from now. From now. From henceforth. From now until the end of what? Well, the end of the age. His government is going to what? Increase. Now, it's going to go through our times. What about when our Puritan pilgrim forefathers came over to this wilderness. An empty land, basically. Like I tell people, 
uh, there was no Bob Evans restaurant when they landed here. And uh, 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 Hilton or anything like that. You know, all oh, you poor babies, come on in here. You've had a hard trip, haven't you? They didn't have any of that. It was just bare land, nothing here. The Indians haven't built any hotels. There wasn't any, any casinos for them. None of this for them. When I think of all the lies that have been told us about the Indians, I mean, it's like we couldn't do, we're, the, the white man was so feeble, he couldn't do anything without the Indian. And America's a blessed nation because of the Indian. What false history? They've been writing our history and lying to us and lying to us and lying to us. And like Brother Ramsey was talking, this is coming from the public educational system. Again, I agree wholeheartedly with you. I'd, I'd rather our children grow up dumb and ignorant than going to this brainwashed school system it, that we've got today. Amen. But shouldn't that give you a vision right there? Say, well, you know, he's right. We've got a lot of work to do then. Our forefathers, when they came over to this, this nation, they built Christian universities. Yale was a part of a, that was a Christian university. Do you understand that? Yes, Not today, of course. It's been taken over by the Antichrist. Like you said, Jews came in, Jewish lawyers, Jewish bankers. They came in, by the way, and used Christian names way back then. And they infiltrated the church, and the church, you know, they were kind of dumbed down too. And they let them in and let them have power and control. And this gradualism over time. Like people use the example of a frog, you know. They throw it in, in uh, cold water and turn up the heat and it'll boil it that way. If you, they say if you take that frog and throw it in hot water, it'll jump right out. But if you gradually turn up the heat, it'll boil to death. Well, that's true or not, it's a good example, right? Turn to uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Acts 1, verse 1. Remember, we are told by our Lord and Savior, occupy until I come. Well, this ought to kick it up a little bit. The former treatise, have I, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Wow. Jesus began his ministry going into the wilderness at the beginning. Do you remember that? For 40 days he went to this wilderness. And, uh, oh, of course, here we get the devil thing again. Oh, he was with the devil, and the devil's tempting him 40 days, you know, and doing all these things to him. And I say, uh, yeah, uh, have you fasted for 40 days? I haven't met anybody yet that's fasted for 40 days. I know people that have done it, but, you know, and, and gone through that. Well, what happens after, um, well, we'll say several weeks? Your stomach starts growling. You get hungry, and you start thinking about food. Now, the interesting thing is the Bible says Jesus was tempted in all things as we are. Well, is that just thrown out to amuse us? Well, he's kind of like you, but he's really God. He's, he's, you know, he wasn't in touch with us at all, really. No, he, he was tempted in all things like we are. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? He had lustful thoughts? I think he did. He was tempted in all things as we are. He felt pain. If he hit his finger with a hammer, believe me, he felt pain. He, got, he had, he manifested himself in this physical body. Okay? For us. He came to die to redeem his people. There's so much in there that it's just powerful information. But he was tempted. And don't you think in his carnal mind says, you know, I'm hungry. And so the Bible talks about this tempter, this devil coming to him and say, oh, you, you could have meat. Or, uh, you know, you could, um, you could have a legion of angels coming to help you out here. You could, you could create this situation here where you wouldn't even have to put up with any of this. He was tempted in all things as we are. Don't you think he was tempted to think, you know, I could, 
I can make this all go away, just like that. No, he had to have a devil pass through. He had to have this devil coming into it. And you again, you understand it says devil. Do you, are you dumb? Well, look up the word devil. It means adversary. Peter, Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Was, was Peter a devil? I, I'm just causing us to think here. I mean, when you get into things like Lucifer, who is Lucifer? It says he's the king of Babylon. And it says, is this the man? Did they make did they cause the nations to tremble? And, and Paul, it's like uh, he was a world only king. And when he died, it says, did they narrowly look upon this him as the man which had caused the nation? You know, when he died, they, it fell. It caused a great economic upheaval and, polit upheaval and political upheaval, right? So we've got to get an understanding, at least think about, is it really true what the Judeo-Christians have been teaching us about the devil? I mean, is God fighting this, there's a good God over here and the evil God over there? You think about it. But this is interesting, what we're reading here. Pertaining things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's what he taught them for 40 days, basically. And he gave them commandments and instructions. What is he teaching them at this time? Again. Well, it says things of the kingdom. These verses tell us, again, Jesus was with his disciples. Very important there. I'm not going to get into that any further. I haven't got time. He wasn't teaching his disciples things of the kingdom that were not going to happen for two or 3,000 years. Why was he teaching them things of the kingdom? Uh, now, I'm teaching you things of the kingdom, disciples, because, you know, I, uh, I this is something that you, you're not going to see now. It isn't going to do any good. But in 2,000 years, I'm coming again, and the kingdom will be ushered in, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm preaching to you, and I'm giving you commandments about a kingdom that doesn't even exist. Instructions about a kingdom that doesn't exist. No, he, he was giving them king instructions about a kingdom that is now. This is after the resurrection. A new era, a new order started. Comprende? No, I'm not Mexican. <laughs> uh, turn to Mark chapter 10. We're going to talk about children. Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. And it says, And they brought young children to him, meaning to Jesus, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. And when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. I just love, these words are right there for us to see. But have we put them together correctly? Have we seen the kingdom vision? Verily I say unto you, Jesus says, Whosoever shall not receive, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, and he put his hands upon them, and blessed them. How many of you like that story of our Lord and Savior? It touches your heart, doesn't it? But I have a question. Some of you may not like me for saying this. But the question is this. What children was Jesus holding in his lap? Were they all the children of the world, as the Judeo-Christians taught me? You know, I remember in Sunday school way back when, you know, singing, you know, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And if you got a little rhyme like that, it just sticks with you all these years. Well, is that a truth or a lie? <clears throat> you know, was, was there a black child and a black family there? And they put, oh, Jesus, would you hold my little black child here? And, oh, it's so Chinese, would you hold my little baby here? You know? And, and all the various children of the world are there with Jesus in his lap. What a wonderful picture of multicultural Christianity. Is that what it's all about? No, he was holding white, Adamic, ch Israelite children in his lap there. And he was blessing them. And, it's, and he's, 
And it's about the kingdom, folks. You get that? Now, when you're thinking about the children, what do you, what do you think about? I think about children that grow. Don't you? Children grow. It's a, and he says, of such are the kingdom. They learn and they grow. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, verse 30. You know, as children need to grow, the kingdom needs to grow. And not necessarily in the way that you think or in your timing. How many of you get mad at God because I thought it was supposed to happen by now? Or you have your set timing pattern in there and things don't go according to the way you think. And you're, woohoo. You know. It's almost like we have a rapture mentality. And rapture didn't happen. How many of you know, by the way, that we were supposed to be raptured out of here just a couple weeks ago They were sent this thing out? You saw that, brother? And I'm like, are you kidding me? They're still on this stupid rapture stuff? <laughs> I'm kidding. Mark chapter 4, verse 3. And he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare? Think about it. It's talking about the kingdom of God. It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. And when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all the herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowl of the air lodge under the shadow of it. Now, Fowl of the air, lodge it under the branches of it. I think that's akin, kind of. You can get your own opinion if you don't want my opinion. But I think that's kind of akin to what happened when Jesus, that woman, the Syrophoenician woman, and Jesus were having that conversation. And Jesus says, you know, he called her a dog. That's what the scriptures tell. He called her a dog. And she was saying, well, yay, but, you know, uh, the, the dogs can at least eat of the crumbs of the table. Yeah, that's true. And I kind of look at it like the, it, the branches of the kingdom can help the other races out there in various ways. You know, you can't tell me that the white race, we are Israel, hasn't been a blessing. Even in our corrupt ways and our corrupt kingdoms, we haven't been a blessing to the world out there. I mean, it's like this black woman recently said, that, hey, I thank God that the, that the white people are involved in bringing slaves over to America so I can at least be in America today instead of over there in that crap hole. <laughs> and with many parables spoke he unto them as they were able to hear it. I like that, Thorne. As they were able to hear it. Sometimes, in truth, we're not able to hear it. I don't know how many times that's happened in my life. You know, somebody told me something. I, oh, I don't believe that. I'm thinking in my mind. I'm trying to be nice. Well, I don't believe that. And then months down the road, years down the road, all of a sudden, uh, I kind of think I believe that now. <laughs> it's not that we're open-minded to any little idea that comes out there, but when we get two or three or more witnesses from the Scriptures, all of a sudden we can confirm this truth and it becomes real to us, but it takes the power of the Holy Spirit, not just our minds. I'm not like glorifying our mind. I'm glorifying God in all of this. And it says, goes on, and I like this. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he's talking about the crowd. And when they were alone, him and his disciples, he expounded on all the things to his disciples. And of course, Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God here to a mustard seed which grows. Let's move ahead quickly to Luke chapter 1 and verse 68. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, is prophesying here. And he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. That racist, <laughs> narrow minded Zacharias. For he hath visited and redeemed his people. Come on, you know. Isn't, isn't this a one world gospel thing?
thing again. No, it's not. And that was hard for me to come to an understanding of many, many years ago. You know, it was quite a shocker for me of this reality. But you know what? There, there was a carnal mind vision that I had of Jesus, which is not tr a true biblical knowledge. It's not a true biblical vision or understanding. We need a true biblical vision. We need to have faith in God's Word. That what God's Word says to us, it is true. I don't care if the world goes along with it or not. I don't care if the crowd goes along with it or not. In fact, you can use it as a thermometer or a barometer to see if they go along with it, I'm going the other way. Amen? So, verse 69, and have raised up and born of salvation for us, again referring to, for us, referring to Israelites in the house of the servant David, and he spake by the, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, since the world began. My question is, well then, what, what world are you talking about? What world began? And when? In what world did the holy prophets prophesy? Again, it says from the world again. Way back when, I thought, well, that means, I guess, when, uh, you know, Adam, and of course, Adam, you know, he's the father of all the various races. You know, Adam and Eve, they got together and they had a black baby. And then uh, uh, nine months or 12 months later, they had to have a little girl so they could propagate the black race, you know. And then uh, 12 months later, give them a little while. Give them a little rest there. And then they had Chinese baby. And that whole thing started all over again. Finally, you get so white people. And you know, it's, is there this biblical evolution going on here? Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, you got to study that out about Adam blushing and showing red right in the face. It's, it's our people. It's the Adamic white people. That's why I use the term. And I think we all ought to use Adamic Israelites. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Not, by the way, pre-Adamic. And there, I believe there's pre-Adamics. They existed way back when. There's records on that. You know, there's all kinds of shows uh, glorifying the pagan countries, and the pagan religion, and the pagan cultures. Are there not? I mean, you think about, okay, you think about uh, the Hindu uh, Indian culture. I mean, and then uh, let me throw into that the Ganges River. It's nothing but a sewer. It's, you know, uh, there's human defecation in that river. It's flowing with it. It stinks to high heaven, folks. And how many times have we heard about the glories of the Indian nation? I'll tell you what, it was a heck of a lot more glorious when the uh, English Empire was over it. Whether if you're for that or against that, I'm not promoting that idea, but I'm just saying, they cleaned that dumb hole up. And what did, what did Donald Trump say a, a few months ago about these third world countries? They're, well, I won't use the word he said, but they're dumb holes. And he's absolutely right about that. These third world countries are exactly what our president, thank God for Donald Trump. I didn't say he's perfect, but thank God for President Trump. He's done more for Christianity than any other president that I can think of. I mean, maybe uh, uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. But i got to move ahead. Luke chapter 1, verse 71. Luke 1, verse 71. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Do we have people that hate us? And I, now, hey, this is an old covenant that we're reading here. This is in the new covenant, right? Being saved from the hands of all that hate us. To perform the mercies pr promised to our fathers, Israel, to remember his holy covenant. Amen. Think about it. This is important. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham. 
And it goes on down, verse 7, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. All the days regarding whose life? And what are these, who are these, what, who is this oath unto? Who, who are the holy, um, who is this holy covenant unto? Because it says, promise to our fathers, and uh, like verse 30, uh, 73, the oath which he swore to our father, our father, Abraham. Was that a conditional or an unconditional covenant? Folks, it was unconditional. It wasn't the Mosaic covenant when they came out of Egypt, which is a marriage covenant, was formed. And uh, uh, Israel says, all the commandments you said will be good as for like children, and we will do them. And God says, fine, upon your word for this marriage covenant, we'll form a marriage covenant. But you better keep this oath, and this will then do it. But the previous one that he gave to Abraham, he didn't ask Abraham, would you agree to this covenant, Abraham? No, he said, Abraham, I'm making an unconditional oath with you and to your children forever. That's what this is talking about here. It's not talking about the conditional covenant. And by the way, even though we know about the divorce status of the ten tribe nation of Israel and, and, and Judah and all that, we're, all of Israel is still under that original Abrahamic oath and covenant. And God Almighty is going to bring it to pass. But when you want to know, what does this oath mean? What is it all about? What are we supposed to be doing today? One of the most important verse, not the only one, is Romans chapter 9, verse 4. Just to give you, I, I'm breezing through this. Trust me, but I'm giving you something very important here. Romans 9, verse 4. The Apostle Paul says, Who are the Israelites? To whom pretendeth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service to God, and the promises. All these things are named concerning Israel, and what we are to be doing. These are things that we are to be doing, and a part of our service to God. Amen? And so, people, well, I, I don't know, I need a vision. I, I need to know what I'm supposed to be doing. Well... You're supposed to be loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. You're supposed to be doing the things that we're taught in Scripture. There's many principles, Brother Lancher, Brother Ramsey, and, and uh, uh, Don Elmore. We've gone over these. Man, you just went over the Scripture, over the Scripture verse last night, Brother, on all the things of what Israel has done, but what we should be doing, right? And we lose sight of that. We need a vision of what we can be doing. And we're thinking, oh, it's, it's just got to be so high and lofty we couldn't even attain it. Or, you know, and they, and they get this hurry-up attitude. No, you need to get a vision first. You have it, need to have a biblical vision. But I want to close with these two verses. I'm cutting it short. Please forgive me, but I'm cutting it short. But uh, i got to get these in. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. Galatians 4, verse 19. Quote, my little children of whom I prevail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Who is Jesus? He's pure, concentrated, unadulterated righteousness. That's who he is. Colossians 1, verse 27. Colossians 1, 27. To whom Christ would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. We are the Gentiles. We are the dispersed. We're part of that dispersion. Amen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and he goes on to say, which is, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Kingdom now essentially is the king and his people. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, folks, when you put this all together, what Christ came to do, he's our redeemer, he's our savior, and he's, he's come to form himself in us and give us his righteousness, not our own. That is really the essential aspect of kingdom now.
God bless you. Thank you.